Greetings and peace. This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with another episode of Interfaith Issues, where we examine the issues of interest to the three monotheistic faiths of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. For the last few episodes, we have been discussing the doctrinal differences that separate Christianity from Islam and how we rectify those differences. Our last discussion ended with the discussion of the Trinity. But while I was providing the evidence that Christians offer for the Trinity and at the same time providing the refutation, we came to the end of the program and I think that some people find that dissatisfying and would like to hear a little bit more on the subject. So I'm going to start with, start with the conclusion to the commentary on the Trinity and then we will progress to the next issue which is the alleged divinity of Jesus Christ. So, to return to the subject of the Trinity, in the last issue, or the last episode, we discussed the, the main uh, evidence that the Catholic Church holds up as evidence for the Trinity, and that is the first epistle of John 5, 7 through 8. And we showed how modern Christian scholars have cast this verse out because it has been recognized to be a misleading insertion. And as a result, modern Christian scholarship has removed it from the more modern day, uh, the more scholastic Bibles. Falling back on whatever evidence can be gathered, since the Bible has now lost this statement, I should say is the statement that the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, uh, these three are one. It is this passage that is recognized as being the insertion of a scribe, and so it is not scripture, and so it has been removed. So, lacking that evidence for the Trinity, what evidence does the church continue to propose as evidence to support the Trinity? Well, according to the New Catholic Encyclopedia, quote, in the gospel's evidence of the Trinity is found explicitly only in the baptismal formula of Matthew 28:19." Well, what is the baptismal formula of Matthew 28:19? In this verse, Jesus Christ is recorded as having commanded to his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. First of all, putting three names in one sentence does not mean that they share their essence. When we say lions and tigers and bears, oh my, what do we think of? If not lions and tigers and bears, separate entities. Nobody thinks of an animal which somehow shares the feature of all three. So, although the formula says baptize in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, that in no way implies that these three are one. A more profound point to be made is that Mark 16, 15 state, well, it relates the exact same great commission in which Jesus Christ sends the disciples out to baptize, but it leaves out the formula, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So which of these two baptismal formulas is correct? Hard to say. Or is it? Because one thing we can do is we can look at what the disciples actually did. And if we look at what the disciples are actually recorded as having done, they went out and baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, what does this tell us? This tells us either that they did not do as they were told, which means that everything they ever said and did would be suspect because we cannot rely upon them, or if they were doing as what they were told, then the formula, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit doesn't apply because what they actually did 
was baptized in the name of Jesus. Another evidence would be that in John 14, 9, it relates that Jesus Christ is alleged to have said, quote, He who has seen me has seen the Father. And you will find Christians who say this. Jesus Christ said, He who has seen me has seen the Father. Well, there it is. He's saying, you're seeing me, you're seeing the Father. No, 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 no. That's not what he said. He said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. In metaphorical language, that can mean that you are seeing the representative who represents the revelation conveyed from the Father. Is there stronger evidence to support that viewpoint? Absolutely. Absolutely. In John 5, 37, we read, quote, You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. Jesus Christ stating that you have never seen God's form or heard his voice. And yet he is standing physically in front of them, telling them with his voice, saying, you have not heard God's voice, and Jesus Christ is the one who is speaking. So if they're hearing his words, and he is saying you haven't heard God's voice, obviously Jesus Christ cannot be God. In the same way, he is standing in front of them bodily, saying that you have not seen his form, and yet they are looking at him. So if they have not seen God, and they are looking at him, obviously, he cannot be God. When all else fails, John 10, 30 is cited as a reference. This is the verse that states, quote, I and the Father are one. No, well, there you have it. I and the Father are one. Argument settled. No further discussion. Uh, except for a few points. Number one, again, the language is very likely metaphorical. Number two, John 17, 11 reads, quote, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. Okay. Now you no longer have a formula of a trinity, three in one. You have to include all of the disciples, all of the followers of Jesus, because Jesus Christ is saying that they may be one, as we are. How far do you want to expand this blasphemy? In John 17, 21, the metaphor is reinforced with the quote, that they, referring to all believers, all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they, all believers, also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. As I said, how far do you want to expand the blasphemy? If we are going to say, I and the Father are one, means that Jesus is one with the Father, here we have another quotation saying, make all the believers one in us. How far do you want to take it? Clearly, this not stand up to reason. John 10.30 is a widely misapplied verse. How did Jesus Christ present this verse? Did he present it as the people understanding that they heard him right or that they heard him wrong? Well, the Jews, when they heard this verse, a couple verses later, how do they respond? They respond by picking up stones 
to, to stone Jesus to death. What is his response? He asks them why. And they say, quote, you being a man, make yourself God. We have jumped only from John 10.30 to John 23. Okay? We have gone from the quote, I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up rocks to stone him. He asks why. They say, you being a man, make yourself God. Put yourself in the situation. If you were God, all-powerful, in control of the situation, you wouldn't be afraid of a few stones. You wouldn't be afraid of anything. You would stand up with the omnipotence of the Almighty, and you would say, you heard me right. I said it once, and I said it again. That's not what Jesus Christ did. He stood up and told them, you heard me wrong and went on to explain how in Jewish idiom the language is metaphorical and the Jews actually called their judges gods, not sons of God, not children of God, gods. Is this surprising? All over Western society you find people using this metaphorical language to the point where I even had a colleague call me a god. One day I was doing surgery and this person said, Dr. Brown, you are the god of cataract surgery. the Billah. I seek refuge in Allah that I even distracted a person to say such blasphemy. But how many times do we hear people saying, oh, he's the god of so-and-so. This guy is so good at such-and-such, -such, he, he's like a god. The metaphorical language existed in that day as it exists in this day. In any case, as I have said before, the, the Holy Quran has statements which correct and guide us to the focus that we should have upon this issue. Quote, do not say Trinity, desist. Quote, they do blaspheme who say God is one of three in a Trinity, for there is no God except one God, Allah. Quote, your God Allah is one God. Whoever expects to meet his Lord, let him work righteousness and in the worship of his Lord admit no one as partner. And who else transmitted that message that your God is one God? Jesus Christ. Three places in the Bible, as I have said many times before and as I'm going to say today, now three times in the Bible, he said, no, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. So that is not only the message of the Holy Quran, that is the message of Jesus Christ and of all of the prophets who preceded him. We just finished discussing the topic of the Trinity and we're going to move on to the topic of the alleged divinity of Jesus Christ. So to begin with, I would have to say that if we do not want to look any further, we only have to look at the Bible to come to an understanding that Jesus Christ himself denied divinity. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you find this quote. Quote, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. John 14, 28, my father is greater than I. Now, if Jesus were divine, how could it be possible that God is greater than him. But this is what he says, my father is greater than I. John 8, 28, I do nothing of myself. I do nothing of myself. But as the father taught me, I speak these things.
John 5, 19. Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. Now, I have a list here. I'm not going to read it all. I'm just going to skip down to where Jesus said, as I've quoted many times, quote, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Another quote. But of that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Nor the Son, but only the Father. Mark 13, 32. Another verse, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve, Luke 4, 8. So we find many examples in which Jesus Christ speaks directly to the fact that he is not God. He subjugates himself to God. If Jesus never claimed divinity, what was he exactly? Can we not believe that Jesus Christ was what he said he was? Eighty-eight times in the Bible he called himself the Son of Man. Never once called himself the Son of God in a begotten, not made sense. Never once called himself the Son of a God in a literal sense. Can we not believe what he called himself, the Son of Man? Can we not believe him when he said, quote, a prophet is not without honor except in his country, a prophet? That's what he called himself. Can we not believe it when he says it cannot be that a prophet, a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem? Who is he talking about? He's talking about himself, a man and a prophet. Where in all of the scriptures did Jesus Christ ever call himself the Son of God or attribute divinity to himself? Nowhere. Now, Everybody who is watching this series should know by now that everything I speak about is based upon my book, the first in a series called Misguided. The book is available through Amazon.com. You can read portions of it on my website, leveltruth.com, along with articles and unpublished chapters. Why am I saying all of this? Because everything that I am saying you can find here. Go to leveltruth.com, L-E-E-V-E-L-T-R-U-T-H, leveltruth.com. You will find the book. Everything that I am saying, you will find there and a great deal more. So forgive me if I skip over pages and pages and try to highlight only the essential elements, but we cannot cover it all. The points that I would like to cover are these. It is stated in the Christian sources that the only New Testament verse that supports the doctrine of the Incarnation is 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. However, this is the verse that states that God was manifest in the flesh. Problem. Problem is this. Quoting Gibbon, quote, This strong expression might be justified by the language of St. Paul, but we are deceived. We are deceived by our modern Bibles. The word which was altered to God at Constantinople in the beginning of the 6th century. The true reading which is visible in the Latin and Syriac versions, still exists in the reasoning of the Greek as well as of the Latin fathers. And this fraud with that of the three witnesses of St. John is admirably detected by Sir Isaac Newton. Fraud? That's an awfully strong word. But it's a word that is apparently well applied because, quote, some passages of the New Testament were modified to stress more precisely that Jesus was himself divine. End quote. 
The Bible was modified for doctrinal reasons? Hard to imagine. But in Bart D. Ehrman's words, quote, a later scribe had altered the original reading so that it no longer read who, but God made manifest in the flesh. In other words, this later corrector changed the text in such a way as to stress Christ's divinity. Our earliest and best manuscripts, however, speak of Christ who was made manifest in the flesh without calling Jesus explicitly God. Ehrman adds, quote, as Wettstein continued his investigations, he found other passages typically used to affirm the doctrine of the divinity of Christ that in fact represented textual problems. When these problems are resolved on text-critical grounds, in most instances, references to Jesus' divinity are taken away. In fact, when we read the Bible, we read a very human account of Jesus Christ. We read of a baby who was born into this world by childbirth, flushed into this world with amniotic fluid, a baby dependent upon its mother for sustenance and nurturing, a baby who grew to a normal human being that no doubt ate worldly food, drank worldly drink, and followed that up with a trip to the worldly bathroom. These are signs of a human nature. These are not attributes we instinctively attribute to God. God does not need anything. God may be pleased by our service and worship, but he does not need anything from us. But Jesus needed. He needed food from his mother. He needed nurturing. He needed as he grew up. He needed the things that all human beings need. He prayed. To whom and why? If he were God, who is he praying to and why? He fasted again. Why? He prayed to be saved from the persecution that he saw ahead of him. An almighty God praying to be saved? To who? If not a man praying to almighty God. God is all-knowing, but in Mark 5.30, Jesus did not even know who had touched his clothes. God is all-powerful. But in Mark 6, 5, we're told that Jesus could not perform any miracles where he was. As per some translations, he could do, quote, no mighty work. In Mark 8, 22 through 25, Jesus failed to heal a blind man on his first attempt. God would never fail. God never weakens, and yet... Jesus needed strengthening. The angels ministered to him in Mark 1.13 and Luke 22.43. Jesus slept, but God never sleeps. Jesus was tempted by Satan, and yet James 1.13 tells us God cannot be tempted with evil. Jesus prayed and gave thanks. He fasted. He carried the teachings of God, and in the end, he helplessly suffered humiliation and torture at the hands of misguided tyrants, the example of an almighty God or the example of a very human prophet. We move from examining the humanity of Jesus Christ to a refutation of the evidences. We look at Jesus Christ, who he was, what he did, the teachings he conveyed, we see a very human prophet. As I am flipping pages, I am flipping pages and pages and pages that go on in the same manner that I discuss the first issues. You can look these up at, at your leisure. I've told you where to find them. On the website, leveltruth.com, in my book, Misguided, available through amazon.com. But next issue, we're going to continue with the discussion of what the Christians hold up as evidence of Jesus' divinity and provide 
specific refutation. For now, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown completing this episode of Interfaith Issues, thanking you for being with me, hoping to hear from you through my website,